I will welcome everyone to the second episode of SEPAD Discussers. What we're going to do today is discuss a wonderful new book um, called A Fraternal Enemies by Clive Jones and Joel Gozanski. Uh, I'm delighted that Clive is here today to talk about the book with us and alongside him uh, we have two wonderfully qualified um, and re respected scholars who are going to help us to, to dig a little bit deeper into some of the questions that the book poses. It, it's a really, I think, appropriate time to engage with some of these questions, given what happened uh, about, well, just under a month ago now with the, the normalization of relations between the UAE and Israel. So I'm really delighted that we've been able to pull this together. Um, so I will quickly introduce our panelists and then we will get on with the session, which will be split roughly over the hour. We'll do 30 to 40 minutes of discussion amongst ourselves and then we'll open the floor to Q&A. If I can ask you to put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, that would be very helpful in terms of, of collating all the questions according to um, well, most appropriate things that we need to, to be aware of. So first and most important, of course, is Professor Clive Jones, uh, Professor of Regional Security in the School of Government and International Affairs. Clive is the author of, in addition to Fraternal Enemies, The Clandestine Lives of Colonel David Smiley, Codename Grin, uh, published last year with Edinburgh, uh, and also a number of other books, including Britain and the Yemen Civil War, 1962 to 1965, and with Emma Murphy, Israel Challenges to Identity, Democracy, and the State. He's also published a, a, a large number of articles pertaining to Israel and the Gulf and regional security across the Middle East. I'm also delighted to welcome Professor Rory Miller, who is Professor of Government at Georgetown University in Qatar, where he teaches and researches on small state and regional security and theories of external intervention. He's the author of The Wonderful Desert Kingdoms to Global Powers, The Rise of the Arab Gulf, but published by Yale University Press in 2016, along with a number of other books pertaining to Israel and the Palestinian question, um, and along with, of course, a range of articles looking at the same types of questions. And last, but by no means least, is Dr. Imad Mansour, non-resident scholar with the Middle East Institute and adjunct professor in the Department of Political Science at McGill. And Imad is the author of the really timely and interesting book, Statecraft in the Middle East, published by I.B. Taurus. So we have a wonderful panel here today. I'm really delighted that we could make it happen. So what we will do is start with Clive. If I can ask you just to provide a little bit of context about why you why you and Yol sat down and, and wrote this book, please. What was it that was driving you when you were engaging in this project? And why did you, uh, why did you even start the project in the first place? Thank you, Simon. Thank you for organizing this today. Um, it goes back actually to um, July of 2015. I happened to be in Israel at the time working on another project I wanted to do um, with Israel's approach and the dissonance within the security establishment towards the increasingly belligerent tone towards Iran. And um, the, uh, the national newspaper Haaretz um, had a headline and the headline was Saudi number plates spotted in Yaffa or Jaffa. And this intrigued me, you know, you don't see that many cars with Saudi number plates driving around the streets of Jaffa or Tel Aviv, but it transpires actually what had happened is that a Saudi businessman had driven through uh, Jordan crossed the border, the Arab border between Jordan and Israel, driven up to see uh, an Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, businessman in, in Jaffa to, to, to conclude some kind of business deal. And it's that one single incident that, I, that, that made me think, there's something going on here. And of course, you know, secrets are very, very difficult to keep in much of the Middle East. And there had always been these sort of sources, these stories coming out about covert or clandestine um, engagement between Israel and many of the Gulf states. And all this was based on um, hearsay. But this combined, dare I say it, with the uh, WikiLeaks cables, which for the first time actually opened a window onto actual negotiations and discussions that had taken place, um, predating this, actually going back to uh, the early noughties. Uh, engagement between, for example, the former Israeli foreign minister uh, Zippy Livni, the, uh, the, the Emirati foreign minister, uh, 
that goes back to sort of you know, 2005, 2006. And also the wider reaction amongst many Gulf mon uh, monarchies towards uh, the 2006 Israel-Hezbollah war. And while Hassan Nasrallah for a while was very much the poster boy, if you like, of Arab resistance and enjoyed great approbation across the Arab street um, in terms of the perception that Hezbollah had actually won that war, had faced Israel down, what was clear was that actually many of the Arab Gulf monarchies had thought and indeed had hoped that the Israelis would go, were going to cut Hezbollah down to side. Of course, the link being that Hezbollah has always been seen as this, as the surrogate actor, non-state actor, a powerful one nonetheless, of uh, Iran. So these kind of strands began to sort of come together in our thinking. And I happened to know uh, Yol Gazansky, and in, initially it was his idea to get together. And Yol works in the Institute for National Security Studies in Tel Aviv, and he is formerly an official working for, the, um, for uh, the Prime Minister's office. And we came together and we discussed, okay, so clearly is something is, is, is going on here, what? Now it would be very easy to sort of put this together as some kind of exercise in detailed journalism, but clearly there are patterns of engagement working here that needed, I think, to be informed by a sort of conceptual understanding of the way that um, diplomacy takes place behind the scenes. You can call it clandestine diplomacy, you can call it hidden, hidden, hidden diplomacy, and so forth. But what really interests us was that how these ties often seemed to be deeper and indeed more entrenched than official ties. And just to give you one example, I mean, if you look at the, the peace treaties that Israel has, the open peace treaties that Israel has with Egypt and uh, with uh, Jordan, actually these are kind of more akin to non-aggression pacts than actual peace treaties. And it seems to us, therefore, that the level of engagement that Israel was beginning to uh, have with many of these um, Gulf monarchy states was even deeper than these official peace treaties. And so we began to explore, we began to think about a kind of a framework that we could apply to really understanding this. And we borrowed very much from the literature on security regimes, but in particular, the work of one Israeli academic who deserves great credit for developing in, initially the idea of the tacit security regime, which we use a man called um, Aaron Kleiman. And so we use this idea of a tacit security regime uh, to really explore the uh, ties that we had begun to emerge. And we were, in some ways, we were helped, first of all, by having very good access to some sources in Israel. Secondly, despite its reputation as being very much a securitized state, um, Israelis talk, and they often talk quite openly. So our access to some of the information that we actually had, we could actually, we actually compare and contrast to see what was chaff and really what was the wheat, the, wheat, the substance of, of, of the argument. And equally, our own travels um, around the Gulf, we were able to talk to uh, several uh, fairly well-placed uh, Arab interlocutors in, in places like uh, Bahrain and, um, and, and in Qatar and so forth. And they were able to express to us their views on what was actually happening, although I have to say they were very guarded about where they would actually say these um, things to us. But even so, it was quite clear that relationships uh, were developing. And clearly these relationships, at least in terms of Bahrain, the, the Emirates um, and, uh, and the Saudis, was very much configured towards engaging what they saw as the threat across the Gulf, that is um, from Iran. But that wasn't the only thing. I think there are two other things that really do come out from this, and perhaps then I'll stop there and I'll let the others uh, jump in. The first thing um, clearly is that there were growing commercial ties. Clearly much of this was related to this, the Israeli sale of high-tech uh, equipment, particularly to, but not exclusively to um, the Emiratis. And it's what one Israeli called um, the use of Israeli soft power for hard strategic edge. And I think there's very much this growing perception amongst many Israelis that actually what we, what they saw the Gulf monarchies as being are almost front line states themselves in confronting Iran. And, and clearly you look at the, the personal role of Netanyahu here, the drive and the effort he put into undermining the JCPOA, a position, by the way, that was clearly supported 
by many of, 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 of the Gulf monarchies and trying to um, thwart an Iranian nuclear program. So that's the first element to it. The second element to it, however, is that many of the Gulf monarchies want to engage with Israel precisely because it gives them, as they see it or they perceive it, greater clout in the corridors of power in Washington itself. So it's a kind of a, a two-way two edge. And thirdly, just to, just to finish off briefly here, I think for many of the Gulf monarchies, but I'll, you know, I, the, the three that are closest to Israel, Bahrain, uh, uh, the Emiratis and uh, the Saudis, they look at the way on its own terms that Israel is actually engaging with what they consider to be Iranian expansionism, its sponsorship of proxies across Iraq, across uh, Iraq rather, uh, across Syria, and indeed, of course, Lebanon um, itself. So I think sort of the, 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 there's a strong strategic and ultimately a hardcore realist element to this. But from that hardcore realist element, other elements in terms of creating a stronger relationship between uh, the Gulf um, monarchies and Israel developed. And that's really what we're looking at in the book. We use this construct of a tacit security regime. I'm happy to sort of explore at greater length how we define that. But we use, the, therefore, the concept of the, of the tacit security regime. And we conclude in the book that the regime itself provides the needs for all concerned. We do say it may result in the establishment of formal diplomatic ties. And clearly, that has happened in, in the case of the Emiratis. It's still to happen in the case of the Bahrainis, the Omanis, uh, and the Saudis. Um, but who's to say that that won't happen you know, in the coming months or indeed over the next year. I don't think it will happen immediately with the Saudis and we can discuss the reasons why later on. Uh, if any other uh, the other Gulf states are likely uh, to open formal ties, it's more, it probably will be uh, the Bahrainis. But again, you know, this ultimately is beyond the, the, the purview of, uh, this is crystal ball gazing, it's not sort of looking at it conceptually. But nonetheless, I think the trend is clearly there. Fantastic. Thank you, Clive. That's just raised so many uh, interesting and important points that we can pick up on um, during the course of our conversation. But perhaps, Rory, can I come to you just for some general reflections on the book before we go into maybe some more conceptual discussions, please? Sure. First of all, Simon, thanks for the invitation. It's good to be here today with you guys. It's always a pleasure to see you all. Um, you know, this is a book that needed to be written. Um, it always surprised me that it hadn't been written before, but in a way, you know, I think Clive and his co-author chose the perfect time to do it. As in hindsight, we may argue in context of the UAE-Israeli developments in, in recent uh, weeks. Um, and this is a topic that I've been dealing with both directly and indirectly in, for many years. And, and one of the things that the book, you know, made me realize is some of the issues that I thought were very clear in this unofficial, indirect, um, relationship are actually the way it's handled in the book they make you rethink them and then some of the things that you were less clear about become much um, more clear for instance and, and, and we don't have to address this particularly now because i think it's a key issue this issue of using a security regime to overcome the ideological constraints of the failure for israel to do a peace deal with the palestinians um, now i think this is something that has always been a point of discussion both in Arab-Israeli relations, but also in intra-Arab relations. If you go back to the founding of the Arab League in 1945, and the British were very heavily involved in that, and if you look at the documents in the Foreign Office records, the one constant was, without the Zionist issue, there would be no Arab League. Right? And so this has been at the very heart, uh, and certainly it wouldn't have been sustainable given their own intra-Arab differences. Um, so this is at the very heart, not just at the Gulf-Israel um, relationship, but at the, how the Arab states in total perceive themselves. And in those terms, I think it's very interesting about the Arab League's response. Where some may argue it's not as significant an entity as it was in the past. Some may argue it's never really a significant entity in practical terms. But I think you know, the book does a good job in showing, lay, locating this in the wider context of the historical issue of Israel in the wider Arab world. The other two points I just sort of raise as an opening is, you know, I think it's very clear before I read this book, I actually was under the assumption that any 
formal relationship between Israel and the GCC states, whether it was Saudi, Bahrain, or the UAE, would be the beginning of a process. But actually, and uh, Clive may disagree or correct me if I'm wrong, I've read this book twice now, and actually, in many ways, you could argue this is the end of the process. This is the end of the road, not the beginning of the road. For many of the points that are made in the book itself, in terms of the ideological constraints, in terms of Israel's perception of the Gulf states as a new front line in the battle with Iran, I think that's hugely unlikely to happen. The Gulf states have been, and, and Imad is writing a book on Iran and Israel, and he may disagree, but um, you know, the Gulf states have been brilliant at making sure they're not the front line in the war between Iran and others, right? And when the uh, United States have attempted to put them there, for example, in the second Bush administration, they've been very good at avoiding that responsibility. And it may have been strategically or practically uh, common sense to do so, but the idea that if this relationship is to move forward is based on the Gulf states suddenly donning the mantle of strategic balancers or, um, of Iran in this region for the benefit of Israel, I think we're at the end of this relationship. There are commercial issues, there are other issues. And then the other one, if we're just going to throw it out there, you know, I don't think that in any way, shape or form, this is also going to be the beginning of a possible breakthrough in any kind of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. Everything we've seen over the last five years, including Israel's successes, seem to point to the fact that this is a substitute for substantive relations, improved relations leading to a deal with the Palestinians, rather than something that complements a deal with the Palestinians. So I fully take on board, and I think Clive and his co-author make the point extremely well, that the tacit security regime is a way around the limitations of Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking. But I think it's got as far as it can go, for the reasons that, that, that the book explains very well. And secondly, if the Israels, Israelis are willing to hold on to it, even if this is as far as it can go, because it provides a security benefit in terms of the Gulf states being the front line in the war with Iran, I think that is a misplaced hope as well. But I can stop there and we can maybe discuss those issues going forward. Thanks, Rory. Imad, do you want to add anything to that? And then we can come back to Clive, because I think Rory's just made some interesting points there. We can, we can really cover these if you want, and then I can come back. Uh, please, add, if add Clive to is more. Okay, so the, the, um, the opportunity really to, to discuss this book was really marvelous, and I'm very thankful for all of you, but especially for Simon to, uh, to really bring me on board. And I have to thank Clive for actually writing the book, because what I can see are a series of small articles or commentaries that should come out after the book is really written, because the, 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 um, the landscape and the region has changed or has been in constant really changed, but then we have the book to build on um, in many interesting ways. I have a lot of comments. I will try to restrict them to several really questions. Um, and then hopefully also try to engage uh, the theoretical really framework that this book uh, uh, seeks to put forward. Um, one, issue, and since really Clive is an expert on Israel, um, this is an ideational maybe really question. Why does Israel and or Israelis want these relations? Does that really tell us something about how they want to be understood in the region, accepted? Is there a change from Israel being a fact to Israel being an accepted? Uh, um, actor, um, state, society, Zionist entity, whatever you want to call it, in, in, its, uh, in the region. Um, that is from the Israeli side. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion on, on, on the shift in the iron oil wheel strategy and the mindset, but I'll leave you really to, to speak to that. The second issue really that struck me, um, and I do understand that the process is incremental and it is a process. Although I would like to ask you, do you think we can identify a shift that happened that allowed, quote unquote, or incentivized or encouraged uh, certain GCC states to openly pursue those relations with Israel? Is there something that you can identify that made the change um, appropriate? Um, 
So that would be interesting, I think, to really look at. The third sort of really relates uh, to, to, to the RST that you put forward. And I'm, and I'm going to highlight some um, of the theoretical really claims that it makes based on my empirical observations uh, and based also on some of the empirical uh, demonstrations that the book really makes. One, so, so the big really question, is there a way to, way to weigh those variables that are put forward in the RST? Now, because really, if you look at, at the threat um, from Iran as a factor that's important in building up this relationship, which really figures prominently in the, in the framework as well, um, Oman doesn't seem to have the same really perception of Iran uh, that other Gulf states have, and also Qatar, uh, and also Kuwait. Now, a lot of this unraveled, meaning a lot of the differences in GCC country really positions, unraveled s since at least, at least the 2006 Lebanon war, uh, or Israel war in Lebanon, the second Lebanon war, or whatever really terminology. Um, and then in 2013 and 14, and then with, with, the, with the crisis between the states and Qatar, and also then in 2017. Um, so how does this really variable then get weighed vis-a-vis -vis others? The second and really final point, it also relates to the, to the RSP, relates to the sustainability of Israeli ties with the Gulf. Now this is built into the RST in the sense that the RST recognizes the, the secretive really dimension in order not to uh, provoke internal really resistance, which sort of hints at that there is a lingering real resistance. Um, and, and, and this helps us really think of uh, things that are sort of really missing from the book, if you can really speak to it. Kuwait is missing from the book. Uh, Qatar after 2009 has seen a lot of um, pushback against, you know, the relationship. Um, uh, but also in the book, you mentioned that there is pushback that you expect maybe to see much more openly from the Israeli side, from the settler side, against those uh, sorts of regimes. So, so, not, so it's not only the, 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 uh, the Arab Gulf side that's going to have issues with that, but also uh, many segments in the Israeli really society. So is there a way to accommodate or to account really for that or how you build up this, uh, this argument? Thank you. Thanks, Imad. Clive, do you want to come back to that? But perhaps if we focus a little bit on the um, on the tacit security um, regimes for now, then we can get into some of the more empirical issues that Imad has flagged up uh, after that. Yeah, I mean, the, um, the the way that we constructed the tacit security regime, as I said, we, we drew on the broader uh, literature on regime um, uh, uh, security regime literature, people like Robert Jervis and so forth. But in essence, what we did, we had uh, six variables when we constructed the regime. The first was uh, to look at the idea of geographical distance. Does geographical distance actually matter when you're looking at security regimes? Much of the literature in the past sort of looked at the way that security regimes had developed from the concept of Europe all the way through to alliances in, in, in the 20th century. Clearly, it doesn't, um, although the initial idea of the tacit security re regime as it was first discussed by Aaron Kleiman was very much focused upon just the bilateral relationship between Jordan um, and Israel. So that's, that's the first thing. Secondly, that we, we, we agree that, that often these regimes are ultimately based upon a shared perception of threat. And that really goes to, um, if you like, the, the foundation, the cornerstone of the relationships that have really emerged between Israel and, uh, and the Gulf monarchies. Um, thirdly, that through the tacit security regime, the actors involved do acknowledge there will be ideational limitations to the extent to which engagement can go so far. Um, and again, I might have just raised the issue of, of the settlers in Israel. Well, clearly Netanyahu has always been mindful of his right wing in Israel. Indeed, it's actually quite interesting looking at some of the reaction of the Israeli settlers today towards the agreement. A lot of them don't like it. And they don't like it for the very simple reason is that they actually see the agreement with the with Emiratis being purchased at their expense. That is to say, 
the whole idea of annexation, which Netanyahu had pushed so forcefully as part of his uh, electoral bid and, and again became part of the agreement with the coalition government with, uh, with Benny Gantz, has now been put on ice. So um, the ideational, there are these ideational limitations. And those ideational limitations, I think, are very, very pronounced in some of the Gulf monarchies as well, notably Saudi Arabia. So that's the, that's the third. That the fourth point is that there's still an intimacy here. Um, and this can ultimately um, be configured around shared understandings of the changing configuration of regional power. There is a shared understanding amongst the Gulf monarchies that this is, if you like, an era now that we're seeing of American retrenchment from the region. So what replaces the security vacuum if the United States is no longer the great hegemon that it actually once uh, was? Fourthly, they recognize there can be competition in other areas. You know, their interests do actually diverge, but the mechanism, the tacit security regime itself, does allow for some form of coordination and differences of opinion to actually be thrashed out rather than leading to a breakdown of the relationship um, itself. And finally, and I think this is something that really has marked Israel's diplomacy and indeed Emirati diplomacy, if you like, over the last um, decade or so, is that incrementally and over time, you are signaling to a domestic audience as much as an international audience a growing acceptance of engagement with what had been the enemy. So, for example, we began to see increasingly um, Israelis being invited to uh, events, be they commercial events, be they academic events, in many of the Gulf states. We began, to, for example, to see uh, former heads of the Israeli intelligence service Amar Shodlin, who, who currently heads the INSS in Tel Aviv and former director of the Mossad, Efran Halevi, openly debating some of these sort of uh, issues in neutral forums in places like the United States of America with people like, you know, Prince Turkey Al Faisal. Um, so what we argue is that this engendered a growing acceptance among both uh, uh, um, um, audiences in the Gulf uh, and in Israel itself, that there was this sort of slow rapprochement developing. So that's where our six outliers in terms of our six points, rather than six variables for the tacit security regime lie in explaining the depth and the strength of the relationships that have emerged. Clive, you, uh, thank you for that. I, I want to pick up on something that Rory mentioned, and I also have a bit of a a question to tag onto it. Rory asked the question about an assumption or based on the assumption that the tacit security regime is the sort of the end point in a yeah. process, if I understood yeah. correctly. Yeah. But then reading the book, it seems to be that this is the the starting point or at least something that, that takes place early on in a, in a relationship with perhaps formal relations towards the end, uh, marking the end of a process. So I wonder if you could elaborate on that a little bit, but also what are the contextual factors that are necessary in order for this type of regime to even emerge? For instance, you can't really imagine a security regime, tacit or otherwise, emerging between Iran and Israel now, for instance. So what, what factors are necessary in order for this to emerge? And then um, where does this fit in the, in the broader process, as, as Rory was asking? It's a very good question. And of course, the, the easy answer would be to say, well, it's about the shared perception of threat and it's about Iran. And I think, you know, I said at the very beginning, that clearly is at the cornerstone of this. But there are other elements to this. We shouldn't forget that um, there are broader, some would class them as security issues, but none of, there are broader issues here at play that is actually changing the very nature of the way societies all organize themselves. So, for example, some have argued what has driven the Emiratis to a uh, closer engagement with the Israelis is a realization that the very basis of their uh, economy, basis as it is on oil and gas and so forth, may be coming to um, an end with the uh, advance in renewable energies, with the advance um, in uh, um, um, alternative forms of, uh, well, as I say, gas um, and so forth. So, 
you know, the fact that the Emiratis, just to give you one example here, the fact that the Emiratis have had their first nuclear reactor just go live does suggest that the old rentier model on which the Emirati state had, had actually been built, or the Emirates had actually been built, is actually changing. And therefore, there's a sense that maybe their economic model is also changing. And they're looking, you know, these are, you know, the Emiratis are a high tech country in, in terms of their application and use of, of high technology. They are the, perhaps the most advanced within the Arab world. They look at the Israelis, and they look at the, the Israel is basically a high tech superpower. So there's a kind of a natural meeting of minds in the sense that the Emiratis are ultimately looking to change perhaps longer term investment in terms of their technological infrastructure. And at the same time for the Israelis, if they can attract the type of capital that comes with the Emiratis into their own uh, economic infrastructure, into their own high tech infrastructure, it's a win win situation. So there are these commercial elements. I also think, however, it's also related to the position of the, of, of the United States. I think there is a, a realization amongst many of the Gulf monarchies that you know, the United States is not the power that it actually once was. So what goes in its place in terms of security guarantees? So I think all these things need to be understood um, within the mix. Um, and I think that really does explain certainly why it is at this point that the Emiratis have actually come out of the open. They've almost left, if you want, the, the, the tacitness of the security regime and have now embraced, if you like, open relations with, with, with the Israelis. Um, and I think that it's, it's, in some respects, it's a profound moment for one very other very simple reason. If you look at the peace deals that Israel has signed with both first the Egyptians and then the Jordanians, when those peace deals were signed, they then had to um, work out the various protocols, the various appendices, the various understandings that would actually underpin the peace agreement. Much of this has already, already been worked out between the Israelis and the Emiratis anyway. So in some respects, this will probably be, at least from the perspective of, of the Israelis, a much warmer peace because they've had that connections with the Emiratis over a period of years and other Gulf states, by the way. Uh, than they ever had with the Jordanians and the Egyptians before they concluded their um, before they concluded those peace treaties. Now, does that mean, and this goes back to a point I think Imad was trying to raise, that this will be accepted by the vast majority of the citizenry of, of the Gulf states? Who knows? Probably not. Although ultimately, it, this is a, a, an agreement that is that is concluded between elites. This is very much, if you like and some have, have said it quite openly, that this is, is, is the apogee, if you like, of Netanyahu's individual foreign policy using as his messenger, the current director of, of the Mossad. Whether this will be accepted over time <clears throat> by, by many of the Gulf citizens themselves, well, you know, as I said, time will tell. Can I, can I follow up with Please. something? Please. So uh, also a bit of maybe uh, self-promotion here. So um, uh, <laughs> Always the best. Bill Thompson, William R. Thompson and I just really published a couple of months ago uh, a book um, on shocks and rivalries in the Middle East and North Africa. And in it, we discuss the idea of a shift in the rivalry field in the Middle East. Um, so the shift happened from the Arab-Israel rivalry field as, as a set of uh, dyads, um, uh, which implicated the entire re re region to Iran being the center of a rivalry field with Israel, with uh, uh, the UAE, with Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. Um, so that might help us understand also sort of um, what Simon maybe hinted at as the change in the context that would incentivize the pursuit of such relations. Do you think, and this is maybe, maybe uh, um, um, a bit of a um, um, looking into the glass ball that, that, that you called really Clive, but, but really empirically in the past maybe five years and almost maybe a decade, I think a decade, we've been seeing also the emergence of a new rivalry leg in the region with Turkey. You look at Turkey now acting in North Africa, Turkey acting with, has have always had this ambiguous really relationship with Iran that rivalry scholars don't know how to really categorize competition, rivalry, something else. But you also see uh, the emergence of tense relations with 
GCC states. Um, well, and that relationship with Turkey has also helped to aggravate Qatar UAE relations, Qatar Saudi Arabia, so on and so forth. So, do you think that this shift, um, again, from the Arab Israel field to the Iran really centric now to the emergence of maybe a new rivalry field, would help maybe? Uh, I don't want to use Trump, but the, the, the word meaning, but maybe really consolidate uh, this relationship as uh, the GCC states that, that, that are the focus of the book. See that there's more and more hostility from regional actors, other than or that, uh, that are not Israel. That's not the sort of old ho center of hostility anymore. Yeah. Um the answer to that is <laughs> possibly and I, I i say and i say this if you if you look at the relationship that israel has with the uae it's now increasingly tied of course as you quite rightly mentioned in mind to the growing tensions in the eastern mediterranean and the fact that we're seeing a kind of alignment between turkey qatar uh, certain factions in libya on the one side and uh, greece cyprus um, Israel, Italy, uh, in fact, even Palestine um, and the Egyptians on the other. Much of this, of course, is to do with access to um, gas fields. But I, I would add a, 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 an element of caution here. I mean, we shouldn't forget that as much as there is tension between Israel and, 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 and Turkey, um, they still have diplomatic relations. So the relations are not are not broken. And I think there is a concern amongst some in Israel about being dragged into um, other potential conflict um, areas. So as much as um, Israel has sympathies with certain actors in the region, they have clearly their own um, interests when it comes to the, it, their own gas fields, the, the, the Leviathan field um, in, in particular. I'm not sure that Israel would necessarily see its engagement with some of these actors just in terms of what military power they could actually bring to the table. I think Israel's treading on this very, very, very cautiously. Can I just go back very, very briefly to, to the points that um, Rory made? Um, I agree with, with about 90% of what you have to say, Rory, um, but the point is that the perception, and it's the perception held by Israelis, is that they do see the Gulf states as being in the front line. Part of the debate that took place in Israel recently over whether, and is still taking place, I should add, about whether Israel should um, waive its veto that can undoubtedly exercise in terms of the sale of the F-35 fighter is precisely extent, do you, do you trade this in terms of maintaining Israel's qualitatively military edge, or do you allow the Emiratis to develop and have this high-tech military capability with the understanding that it's not focused upon Israel, it's focused upon another enemy. My sense is after Pompeo's visit to uh, Israel and, 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 and to the region um, following the announcement of, of the Gulf deal, I think that argument has already been won by the Emiratis. I think they will get the F-35. Whether they'll get the, the highest grade F-35 is another issue, but they will actually get the F-35. And I think Netanyahu, part of this was grandstanding, part of this was due to due to the fact that he hadn't actually consulted his defense establishment over the price that Israel had to pay in order to get the agreement with the United Arab Emirates. I fully agree with you on your observations regarding the Palestinians. This is not about solving the Palestinian uh, problem. And as one Israeli left-wing commentator, Professor Eli Podei, said recently in one of his articles, uh, he said, you know, it, we, it, it, it would be very, very, very nice to visit Dubai, but actually, Let's get the relationship with Ramallah sorted first. And I think you're absolutely right. This is about circumventing the Palestinian issue. It is not about uh, solving it. The final thing here, I mean, I, I think Imad made the point about other relationships. And you're right. I mean, the book doesn't deal with Kuwait for a very simple reason. The relationship between Israel and Kuwait is virtually non-existent. In terms of Qatar, however, I think it's a very, very interesting relationship because as much as the Emiratis have excoriated the Qataris for their continued support of various Muslim Brotherhood organizations. Actually, 
Israel needs the Qataris and it needs the Qataris in order to ensure at least some form of stability, some form of peaceful stability within Gaza uh, itself, particularly since the Americans uh, cut their funding to, um, to, to, to UNRWA. So it's actually an Israeli strategic and national interest to ensure that the Qataris actually have a role to play. Um, how Israel may try to bring the Qataris further in, into the process will very much depend, I, I think, upon intra-Arab relations, intra-Gulf relations, and the extent to which they can actually then reach out to the Qataris without upsetting their other Alf, Arab Gulf interlocutors. Can I just very quickly, Simon, if you have one minute, I just want yeah, to come to this point. Um, you know, both, I think a very important point that Imad mentioned is the issue of legitimacy. You know, both, and, and Clive also mentioned in terms of the incremental legitimacy of engaging formally with Israel in Gulf states. And I think the book shows this very, very well in these small steps that will ultimately lead to something else. But I just want to go back to a couple of points that you both sort of addressed. The first thing that I want to say here is this What has the cost been for Israel of doing this? None. There is no cost at all, domestically or externally, um, because the price that they traditionally believed they would have to pay for normalization was um, advancement on the Palestinian issue. Um, and I think this is really important because if you turn the whole thing around and ask, would this have happened? Is this important enough to Israel to pursue if they have to make real concessions on the Palestinian issue? No. I mean, the issue of annexation is a bit of a red herring. You know, 10 years ago, if someone had said that Israel would agree not to annex the West Bank is progress, people would have said, well, that's ridiculous. So I think that what you have here is one side is getting some benefits, but at no cost, and the other side is taking quite a risk. And this goes back into the points that you said, changing perceptions of American security guarantee, Turkey, but I'd add another one as well, and Iran, of course, as you mentioned, but for about the last four years, the UAE have worked very closely with Saudi Arabia, trying to develop a sort of cooperative relationship that developed a primacy in the region. Um, they wanted to establish themselves as leaders, leaders of the sunny world, leaders of the Arab states, leaders of the Gulf. And this has not been usually successful. So just as the threat from Turkey, not just in the Eastern Mediterranean, but the Gulf is increasing, and just as America is becoming less reliable, you also see that their strategy during the Obama era to consolidate their position as the dominant actors, both militarily and I guess you could say ideologically, they've totally failed to socialize the rest of the sunny world in terms of their security interests. Um, so that's one of the driving reasons why they are willing to make these steps forward. But Israel has given very little in return. And the other point I would just raise in the short time we have is Turkey is important in another context. In the 1990s, Greek policymakers and Greek experts drove themselves crazy. How do we win over the Israelis and get them working for us in Washington? The Turks are beating us hands down on this issue. To the extent that the annual Hellenic, Hellenic Scholars Conference that was held in Montreal actually in the late 90s, that was the main topic of discussion about the hundreds of people there. We have to be nicer to Israel because we need them in Washington. Fast forward 25 years and the whole table has returned. You have Greece and Israel working very closely on interests um, and working together in Washington. And you have Turkey on the other side of that. There's no reason to assume that in the same time frame, you're going to have a completely different dynamic in this region of the Gulf, just like you had it in the Mediterranean and in the Turkish Greek context. Um, the real test of the long-term solidity of these relations is what concessions Israel is willing to make on the Palestinians for normalization. And of course, that does not in any way minimize the value of this book. You know, you clearly and very importantly set out where we are and where it could go. But I think that's the key point as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, Rory. I think all really, really fascinating stuff. My point would just be to pick up on some of the, the intra-Arab tensions that I think you were mentioning, Clive. Um, it strikes me reading it that there's all these these bilateral processes taking place within the guise of broader, um, quote unquote, Sunni Arab coalition against Iran. But over the past maybe couple of years, there's been fractions and fissures emerging within that block. So those bilateral types of relationships appear to be more bilateral than they perhaps were a few years ago. 
So it strikes me that that might be something interesting to watch, particularly in light of what's maybe going to happen in November or what many of us hope will happen in November and a change of, um, <laughs> yeah, maybe we won't even go there. Um, we've got so many questions coming in. So perhaps we can just move on to, to questions and I'll, I'll sift through them and try and get to as many as I possibly can. Um, there are questions about, um, I'll go to, to one about, um, to what extent do you think the UAE-Israel deal was pushed by an increase in Emirati nationalism? Um, and then do you think the, the deal will help the UAE play a bigger leadership role in the Middle East? But alongside that, there's also a question about uh, whether identity will stay as the main issue in the struggle or will, I guess, will ideational factors be ground down by material forces? So, um, Clive, Imad, Rory, um, any of you want to take a stab at that? I'll, 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 st I'll just say a little bit about Emirati nationalism. I mean, I think there has been um, a shift, a quite discernible shift, um, clearly over the last 10 years and really since he held the whip hand of um, MBZ in trying to um, reconfigure what it actually means to be an Emirati. I think, for example, just to, to use one, one societal example, the introduction of um, national service that Emirati, young Emirati men now have to do, I think it's a year, years national service. Uh, and a move away, for example, from reliance upon, um, to what all intents and purposes were security consultants, some would argue sort of mercenaries as, as commanding and developing the armed forces um, themselves. And I certainly think, I mean, Rory raised this uh, point as well, that you know, the Emirates have certainly been um, far more proactive, uh, not least in terms of places like Yemen, but equally in sort of setting up bases in um, East Africa and so on and so forth. So yes, I do think there has been this sort of increased Emirati role. The Emirates always used to be a kind of a, uh, a status quo power. That clearly has uh, change more so they've come you know everyone used to see them as, as being in lockstep with the Saudis that is no longer the, the case we know for example there have been tensions between the Emiratis and the Saudis over the war um, in uh, Yemen um, so I think the, the Emiratis are certainly carving um, a geopolitical space regionally out for themselves uh, and in, and I think in, in that regard, that probably is an expression of a growing Emirati nationalism. But I defer to the greater expertise of Rory and, and Imad here uh, because of their experience of actually living and working in the Gulf itself. Rory, uh, to... Imad. I just spoke. Imad, please feel free. Uh, so uh, is this about Emirati nationalism? Yes, in the sense that uh, this is a long answer. So the 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 attempt to try to identify really distinctions among the gcc states has been going on since the state building really project happened in earnest in early in the 20th century um uh, because there exists i mean if you think about it as a system those really gulf states which also includes iran and iraq and also Yemen. There's a lot of societal ties, historic ties, there's a lot of trade and exchange, there's a lot of exchanges with Southeast Asia, uh, with South Asia, there's a lot of uh, people really moving and ideas moving. Um, so the attempt since uh, the 20th really century, but most maybe really prominently in the latter part, in the last really decade, has been to try to identify really distinctions. And I think uh, the conflicts that we saw in the Gulf, the crises, only helped to really consolidate the sense of distinctions among the states, that they are independent actors. This is, um, uh, and we are really very different from Qatar, from Kuwait, from Bahrain. Um, one important way of really doing that was through foreign policy and distinctions, what some has called really branding. Um, uh, so in that sense, yes, the move with Israel is some way to try to tell a domestic audience that we are, uh, that we can take our independent action that really fits us. But also there's an element here, but, and I don't want to take all the time, about uh, GCC states, most of them, rightly or wrongly, think that they're path breakers. 
that in some way they have done things that will lead others onto new paths. Uh, that leaves obviously the, the space to be really studied empirically, meaning how much of the space this will open to, to other Arab states or Muslim states that identify with, with, um, with the UAE uh, and others really to follow suit. Um, uh, so yeah, on the, on the question of free nationalism, yes, and we can see it also on the rise in Qatar uh, and the National Day, uh, um, uh, what people wear, how they identify, discussion on what and what is really tribalism. We can see it in the national also entertainment, also projects in uh, Saudi Arabia, um, what they plan to do and what the audience um, uh, and who the audience is. So that absolutely, as the really question asked, the rise of uh, nationals helps us understand uh, those foreign policy moves, yes. Can, can I just very quickly add to that? I mean, Absolutely. Identity. Very important. I would even go as far as saying there are three topics or themes in which you can understand all the foreign policy actions, or at least frame all the foreign policy actions of, of Saudi, UAE, Qatar. Identity. So where all else is equal, they will go with their ideological preferences. Okay. Independence. Acting in ways externally that will allow them to remain, to, contain, to keep hold of political autonomy at home. But the one that hasn't been mentioned, which I think is strategic usefulness, you know, to what extent is this a way of demonstrating their strategic usefulness to allies, including the United States, um, just as their roles may be vis-a-vis -vis North Africa and um, um, Lebanon and Egypt previously and, and in other places as well. So I think when you put those three together, then it's up for the individual to decide how much importance they put on each. But I think strategic usefulness is important as well. How do we assert our independence and identity, but show our value to our partners and our allies as well? Clive, we are really maybe talking more than you because you just no, wrote such an interesting <laughs> book. Sorry, really, really sorry. But, no, but no. One, one last point on the UAE. I think it's interesting, and, and again, I don't want to really take the time to, to dwell on this. Uh, the UAE is not, or has a lot of distinctions between the Emirates on what it should be and what it could do in the world. And this has really to be, or still to be maybe analyzed in detail, how this is influencing foreign policy. Dubai is not Abu Dhabi in its interests and its orientation. We see the differences when all the crises happened, the sort of Twitter feeds and the fights on Twitter, uh, the position of the other also Emirates, again, I don't really dwell on that, but it's really interesting for again, may, uh, people who really want to follow up on this to pick up on the divisions within the UAE and what that means for their foreign policy. Thanks, Imad. We have uh, time for two questions. The final question will be about Trump and the election, just to uh, um, prepare you mentally, I guess. Uh, but before that, we've heard a lot about Iran. But it strikes me that there are other types of um, shared threats, shared strategic concerns um, that Israel, um, the Emiratis, and the Saudis share. Um, this is a point raised by Paul Arts as well, uh, particularly with regard to, to political Islam, the Muslim Brotherhood type organizations. This brings into, uh, into focus Turkey as well. So I wonder, how do we strike the balance in understanding these strategic threats between Iran and and political Islam. Where's the, where's the balance? Is it all really about Iran, or is Iran maybe the, the the headline, but the more substantive concern is actually about political Islam and what that entails as an as an alternative way of ordering regional politics? You guess that, you sorry, Rory, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, you far away. No, I just say very briefly, you know, it depends who you're talking about. I mean, I think the book shows very clearly that from the Israeli perspective, it's all about Iran. Um, now, even when you're talking about Lebanon in those terms, and the book mentions that you're talking about Iran, I think from the Emirati perspective, whether they're right or wrong, they've been significantly concerned by political Islam for many years. And maybe it's understandable and maybe it's not in terms of how they've responded both domestically and externally. Um, but I would say that, you know, I'm not sold completely on the view that this is mutual in the sense that it drives Israel forward in the relationship as much as it drives the UAE. Of course, 
it's a considerable factor in the relationship between Saudi, Bahrain, and UAE versus Qatar. And um, but I don't think it's at the front and center of explaining this part of the overall picture. That's what I'll say. Sure. Clive. And, yeah, I'll just add to that, that I think that there is a debate that, take, that is taking place in Israel about how their past understanding and their, 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 in some respects you can understand it, but their past approach towards dealing with Islamist movements has actually uh, been counterproductive because, you know, for all the, you know, for all the bombing of the Gaza Strip and for all the sort of the, the suicide bombings that have taken place in Israel, although none have really taken place for over the, um, the past decade, decade, ultimately Israel only has one interlocutor that it can talk to. Now the Israelis may not like Hamas, indeed many despise Hamas, but Hamas has proven to be an actor, and this perhaps is quite controversial, that when it says something, it usually keeps its word. And I, there's a realization among some, and it, it is a minority, but there is a realization among some within the Israeli security establishment that at some point, you actually have to talk to Hamas. And, you know, Israel does talk to Islamist movements. In the, in the past, it's, it, it, it's used third parties, notably the Germans, to do this. But Israel does talk to Hamas. The point is, 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 is that there's a, a great, if you like, um, view of political Islam as being this sort of monolithic threat to uh, the I very idea of Israel. And again, many Israelis will point to the, the charter of Hamas and its, and, and its you know, parts of its sort of anti-Semitic and quite openly anti-Semitic claims to see the destruction of, 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 of Jews and, 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 and um, wiping Zionism off the face of the earth and so forth. We, we know all of this. But many Israelis will say, look, if you need, if you really want to have peace, if you really want to uh, have some form of stability where you don't go for these perpetual rounds of, 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 of violence in the Gaza Strip, you have to sit down and talk to your enemy. Now that's going to be a very bitter pill to sell to the Israeli public and many will oppose it. But nonetheless, that is what will have to be done directly, perhaps through the auspices of, 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 of initially of a third party, but, di but, but directly. But it, it does suggest today that Israel still has a rather monolithic view of Islamist movements more broadly across the region. Right. We are almost out of time, but we have time for one final question and I will ask us all to get out crystal balls. Yeah. And this isn't covered in the book per se, of course, but it's, it's something that's, that's been alluded to in terms of concerns about Washington and the United States role in the region. So I wonder, how will all of these affairs that we've been talking about today and um, Israeli Gulf relations be affected by either a Trump victory or a Biden victory in November? Uh, we only have about two, three minutes. So I'll ask you to be brief whilst looking into these crystal balls, but um, Clive, any thoughts? Well, I think, I mean, it. it <laughs> I read in the paper the other day that, that uh, a right-wing Norwegian member of parliament has just nominated President Trump for the Nobel Peace Prize. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, but um, look, the, the, this deal, I think, does enjoy support on both sides of the House in the United States. So I don't actually think that a change of presidency per se will that ever... Will, change the uh, dynamic. Um, if a Democratic can, if, if Biden is to win, if the Democrats were uh, to take the White House um, in November, they will continue. I think the worry for Netanyahu is that his own bipartisan approach to American politics over the last five years will see some form of payback retribution from the Democrats. But in terms of the deal, which is due to be signed, I think, next week, I think it's the 15th of September, that will enjoy, I think, cross-party support in the United States. Thank you. Rory, anything you'd like to add? Any final... Very quickly, just in one sentence. Um, if Biden becomes president, then you're going to see things continue 
a pace because no Democrat or Republican president is going to be opposed to Israel normalizing relations with any Arab country. I think if Trump wins a second term, you're going to see the whole thing come off the rails because the pace that Israel and the Gulf states need to work at is not a pace that Trump has any intention of hanging around with. He wants results and um, he wants results to bolster his own reputation and legitimacy and he doesn't understand the subtleties of what is going on in the region. So I think Biden will take a step back and see that it isn't a bad thing and Trump will push them to a point where it'll all fall off the tracks. Great. Cheery stuff. Imad. Uh, wow. Um, thinking like Israel, I would say um, the moves that were made would, would have been made independent uh, in general, in a strategic sense of who's in the White House. Thinking like the Emiratis and other also Gulf states, I would be tempted also to say the same um, for very different reasons. Again, as really Rory said, that would have very high costs for the for the Gulf states, so they understand what they're going into, and for Israel, that always maybe have been um, a very important really desire, um, maybe goal, um, expectation. I, I don't know. The, the, uh, we started by asking um, why is Israel really doing this, um, and maybe we are still to see why they want to do this in the near future. Um. Okay, well, on that note, I think we're very much out of time, but I would like to thank everyone for coming along and listening and asking all these wonderful questions. A huge thank you to Rory and Imad, but most of all, of course, a massive thank you to Clive for, for coming along and discussing this wonderful book. So very important, and I urge you all to get hold of a copy if you've not done already. So thank you so much. Thank you, Clive. Thank you, Imad Rory. It's been wonderful to host you. I should just say that in two weeks' time, we have another of these events with uh, Chris Phillips discussing the battle for Syria, which actually has uh, a new chapter on Israeli-Syrian relations, which might be of interest to some people here. So thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again, Clive. Thank Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. My thank pleasure. You. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much indeed.